Hey guys, Comic Boom here with another Comic Boom Comic Source collaboration. Unfortunately, Jace cannot join us this week. Uh, Jace is, uh, st unfortunately, uh, Jace is starting off the year getting rid of all his uh, <clears throat> sickness right, right up front. He is, he's actually pretty sick. He's, he had, he thought he had a fever for a while. He, we, we were going to, normally we try to record uh, late Monday evening uh, in, in order for these comic book reviews to be ready by, by the, by Tuesday morning. Uh, but as it turns out, he's, Jason's actually pretty sick. So uh, he's, he's, he's actually in the hospital now. He's, he went to the hospital to get checked out. Hopefully he doesn't have uh, pneumonia. I, I'm sure that all of you will join me in hoping that Jace uh, gets better uh, as soon as possible. I wish him better health. Uh, Jace is a diehard. He he absolutely wanted to join, and I said I said bro brother. <laughs> I texted him. I said it's okay. Uh, this week there's not that many like super great comics. Uh, we uh, you know. Uh, well, we'll get into it, but there, there's a number of comics that I'm, I'm, I know that he probably wanted to review, particularly Batman, uh, probably Batman 141 and Birds of Prey, I would guess, and, and the, the opening issue of Neil Before Zod, and are usually this, uh, probably the bigger standouts for Jace. That's me venturing, I guess, although he does generally like Superman 78, and um, Shazam is somewhat... Uh, is, is always a pleasant surprise by, by Mark Wade, But in any event, um, uh, wow, uh, I just want to give uh, those, who, uh, those who are listening at the, uh, at the Comic Source podcast, I, obviously, uh, it was, uh, I think it was a hell of a year, 2023. I actually enjoyed most of the DC comics that I read. I would encourage you to check out my top 25 DC titles of 2023. I also did a top 10 of the most disappointing titles for DC of 2023. I didn't do the worst because I, I tried to focus on the positive, just the ones that I was disappointed with. And um, yeah, so feel free to check out the Comic Boon channel if you are listening to this on the podcast. For those of you watching on YouTube, well, same old, same old. I changed up some of the styles and the logos a little bit here. And um, well, it's unfortunate that we're starting off the year without Jace, but Jace, we wish you well, my friend. Please get better. Uh, otherwise, people are just subjected to my highly biased rants and raves and nice to, nice to have a little bit of... Uh, another form of bias, namely from your mouth, Jace. Uh, so I guess people are just going to have to put up with me this week. So without further uh, ado, let's get right to it uh, for uh, comic books this week. Titans Beast World uh, Tour of Atlantis is, is out, the one of the many collateral issues of Beast World. Superman 78, uh, Shazam, uh, Poison Ivy, Neil Before Zod, Birds of Prey, Batman 141, Blue Beetle, uh, uh, Neil before Zod, uh, and I, I think I said Birds of Prey and, uh, yeah, Fire and Ice. So yeah, it's, it's actually kind of a short week, uh, which is maybe a little bit of a relief starting off this year slow. It's not like an, an, a week with 18 issues in it, but in any event, let's start off, shall we, with getting right into Batman 141, uh, one of the standouts here, Batman 141, is that the entire issue is, uh, it's it's with Zarana. It's bat the Batman of Zarana is actually hit the consciousness of Batman. Uh, of course, he's got the he's got his Zarana psyche, and it the Zarana portion of Batman's psyche merged with failsafe, and so Zarana is now in the body in in the robotic body of failsafe and there's uh, quite a bit of some very interesting revelations that uh, that take place in the in this in this issue and uh, one of the things that stands out and this is this is part three of mind bomb and it really is a bomb it's a mind bomb because uh, we have to remember that one of the we have to remember that it was actually the Zerna psyche of Batman that programmed Failsafe to take out Batman if he ever crossed the line. But we, it is confirmed here something which we we speculated about based on the the reading between the lines of the previous issues that Zerna Zerna uh, had default programming incorporated into Failsafe that such that if Batman was revealed uh, to have not crossed the line, that the default programming would be to take any such action that would lead necessarily to the Zerna consciousness of Batman being 
essentially uploaded into Failsafe itself. So Failsafe, now Zerna is now Failsafe. And this is, it's very interesting here. And one of the questions I have is, I mean, right away, Batman is thinking, oh God, this is not a great thing. This is not a great thing at all, at all. But it's interesting. We have to remember that one of the things that influenced Failsafe is that uh, when what, what prompted Failsafe not to kill Batman, but instead to send him to another multiverse, another universe, was that Failsafe was actually riddled with and filled up with empathy nanobots, nanobots that were programmed with a degree of empathy, and and one has to rem one has to wonder if if that. Uh, Empathy, those empathy nanobots may ultimately play a role in making it more difficult for Zerna to maintain the type of control over the failsafe programming as he thinks he has uh, in this issue. So that's the wild card. Those empathy nanobots are the wild card here that uh, they don't play out in this particular issue, but you got to wonder if they will moving forward. Uh, I should say this uh, Batman 141 is written by Chip Sardaski, art by Jose Jimenez, uh, and the art is absolutely fantastic. Most of the issue, not a heck of a lot happens, but it's, it's an action-packed issue. It's once again Batman running away, trying to escape from Zerna. He knows he can't defeat Failsafe. <laughs> especially with Zerna in you know controlling failsafe he ba Batman just basically wants to get away and meanwhile Bat uh, Nightwing and Oracle Barbara Gordon are are talking to uh, are are talking to uh, one of the original mentors of, of of Batman who basically warned them and saying look I mean the Joker's involved in this somehow Bat Bruce is going through a hell of a lot uh, you know, do your best to help him out. And, uh, and most of the issue is just, it's one long adrenaline rush action pack issue, allowing uh, artist Jose Jimenez to completely show off his, his artistic skills. It's incredible. So many of the scenes are very cinematic and epic in the, the way visually, the colors, they pop off the page, the way failsafe appears and the way Batman always seems to get managed to get one step ahead of him, but then failsafe gets one step ahead of Batman. And ultimately uh, to the surprise of really, uh, unsurprisingly Batman is uh, despite Batman's best efforts he is ultimately incapacitated by failsafe I mean it's a battle through the snow uh, through the outskirts of Gotham and ultimately Bruce Wayne finds himself rendered unconscious and he wakes up in a jail cell and his cellmate uh, in when well, in the cell right beside him is the Joker himself and the Joker looks pretty beat up he's wearing a neck brace and and Bruce is thinking, oh my God, what the hell happened? And it becomes quite clear that uh, the Joker, the Joker is aware of the, has always been aware of the Zerna prof psychological profile of, of Batman. And Bruce Wayne figured that out and he confronts the Joker on it and saying, look, dude, you know, look, Joker, I know you've always known this. What the hell's going on? How much do you know about Zerna? How much do you know about me? And what's going on? What do you know about the current situation and crisis that, that we face? And, and this will lead into Joker year one. And Joker appears to be quite willing to tell Batman his story, which is quite interesting. The Joker has, let's face it, always been at best an unreliable narrator. So it's going to be interesting to see the story that Chip Sardaski has for us when we when we hit Batman 142 next month. But this issue is uh, very well done. There's a lot of open questions I have. I feel that this is finally getting, we're finally getting back, we're finally getting back on pace to uh, the more exciting aspect of Zardaski's run, in my opinion, I really like the failsafe. I, I like the failsafe storyline. I thought Gotham War completely derailed the momentum that Zardaski had built, uh, but I like to be getting back to the far more interesting uh, story, the more interesting narrative being failsafe. This idea that, you know, the, the, the darker aspect of Batman's consciousness created failsafe and now is ultimately in control of it. And that's how desperate the darker aspect of Batman's persona wanted to leave, leave Batman's consciousness, leave Bruce Wayne's consciousness, his mind, and to enter into a body of his own so that, so that Zerna could no longer be controlled or overridden by the, the, the better side of, uh, 
of, of Bruce Wayne slash Batman. So I really like this. Now, I don't know how much, I don't know if I'm really a big fan of the Joker once again knowing about Batman or Zerna, knowing about Zerna. How did the Joker find out about it? You know, you know what role are the other Zerna consciousnesses going to play uh, from the, the multiverse of Zernas? You know, uh, are, I'm, presumably they're also in the consciousness with, with Zerna. And so we have a whole multiverse of Zernas in the consciousness of, of Failsafe. And how will that play out? And, you know, which Zerna is going to, you know, Zerna is a control freak. We know that Zerna is a complete total control freak. He needs to be in control of everything. He needs to, he, he's a kick-ass, badass character. There's no question about that. But at the same time, he's also someone that needs to be in control. And what happens if he no longer has that? What happens if the other Zerna consciousnesses from the other aspects of the multiverse exert themselves in a more powerful manner? What happens with the empathy nanobots that are also part of uh, Failsafe's programming? in spite of what Zerna has done. How are they going to play a role in this? And the wild card, of course, is always the Joker. What does the Joker know? Does the Joker have some aspect or play a role in the psychological breaking down of Batman that even Batman and Zerna is not aware of yet? So it's very interesting because the Joker always seems to have a wild card of his own in every scenario. So this is, I'm really, I'm, I quite enjoyed this. Batman 141, probably is going to end up being my pick of the week but let's get uh let's go let's let's just wait and get through all this to see be really curious to know what uh, jace would think uh, thinks of this issue i suspect that he would uh find it quite in uh, at a minimum as intriguing as i did and but i guess we'll have to wait for his opinion uh hopefully next week he'll be up and uh, healed up now um all right so the next issue then that we're going to review is birds of prey issue five now, um, writer Kelly Thompson has obviously scripted a narrative of this, uh, this new makeup of a Birds of Prey team consisting of uh, Cassandra Kane, Harley Quinn, uh, Zealot, Black Canary, and uh, Meridian. And they are essentially, on, they're trying to rescue Sin from Paradise Island or sent from Themyscira. Now, what has happened is that, and, and what is what fully plays out in this issue, it becomes clear that uh, Sin, who is the stepsister, or I guess sort of like the, the honorable stepsister of Dinah Lance, the Black Canary, she is essentially, she was essentially, um, she was on, she was being trained on Themyscira, but she's been, uh, th this, otherworldly uh, metaphysical mythological force called the Megara wants to take over sin uh, and wants to essentially inhabit the body and the soul of sin. Now, why is that? How did that come about? Now, I should say here that uh, before I get into the main story, Kelly Thompson is the writer, as I said, and the art is by... Um, uh, Arist D Dane, Arist Dane, D E Y N, uh, Arist Dane, and letters by Clayton Cowles. Now, the uh, I find that the art by uh, is a very stylistic version of Gilliam March. It reminds me a little bit of Gilliam March, but not not quite as clean. But uh, interestingly enough, Arist uh, Dane does uh, does his slash her own colors, and the colors are the, the colors. Uh, give this its own unique feel. The colors do really pop off the page. This is interesting because this is different than the than the art in the first few issues, and, and the colors are much more pronounced and not as muted as in the first few issues. And uh, so the Jordi Belair does not do her muted colors here. It's a, because the artist, Aris Dane, does the colors as well. So I, I thought the art, but the art was, I thought it was pretty good. The action sequences are, are pretty decent. I think the backgrounds are, are uh, very apparent. Uh, they're very interesting. It's easy to identify the characters. There's a lot of action, and Sin herself throughout the issue is is being manipulated by the Mag Magera. And this Magera character is very matter of fact. The Magera character actually doesn't is not intentionally out to necessarily hurt anyone, but has no problem hurting or killing anyone. 
because she wants to possess sin. And what's fascinating here is as the as the series progresses, it or as the story progresses in the story, it becomes clear that the Megara possesses Wonder Woman. And there's a pretty cool sequence where 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 Big Barda and Cassandra Kane have to face off against Wonder Woman. And the only and they know that the only thing they're going to be able to do against Wonder Woman is is basically slow her down. That is the only thing they're going to be able to do against Wonder Woman, because the fact of the matter is, is that when Wonder Woman, I mean, Wonder Woman is obviously the, I mean, she's one of the most powerful characters in the DC universe, while, you know, probably, arguably being usually not particularly the best well-written, although Tom King is doing his best to try to change that, the reality is that Wonder Woman has always been a character that, uh, regardless of how one views the quality of the various storytellers that uh, script Wonder Woman stories, she is well known as being ar arguably one of the most powerful characters in the DC universe. Now, uh, one of the one of the things that really becomes apparent here is Sin confesses to Black Canary that she actually wished very hard to to be to gain more power. Sin feels very guilty that. Black Canary feels that she has to protect her. And Sin, apparently, when she was on Themyscira, she, her desire and wish to be powerful and invulnerable and stronger and more powerful so that Black Canary wouldn't have to worry about her anymore, her wish and her plea was was heard by this mythological go goddess, this, this Megara creature. And even though you know Kelly Thompson I, I think the the writing here was just a just a tad bit off meaning that it's scripted that Megara interpreted what sin said as, as a question Megara defends herself by saying look I, I was just answering a plea she she asked me she asked for my involvement she asked for the power that I'll give her but I've got to possess her soul in order to do this. Well, sin, sin does not say she asked for anything. Sin just says she wishes something. There's a difference between wishing for something and asking for it. I mean, I, I wish I'd win the lottery, but you don't, you don't, it's not appropriate to say I ask for it. Like, who, who are you asking? I mean, Sin doesn't even know who McGarry is. She found out all because all of a sudden this mythological creature appeared. But Plus, if McGarry's looking for a soul to inhabit, I mean, there's thousands of Amazons who I'm sure are wishing they were Wonder Woman all the time and wishing that they had all kinds of wishes and they're aware of these gods. It would seem to me that McGarry would probably have, by, by this time, had possessed one of the many other Amazons. Why choose Sin of all people? What's so special about Sin? Maybe that's going to be revealed in a future issue by Kelly Thompson. Uh, Kelly Thompson is usually pretty good at, at filling in and covering plots a little bit better than this, quite frankly. So I now maybe I'm just being overly harsh, but I thought that was a little bit too simplistic. I felt a little bit forced because it's so sort of like Sin's got to have. There's got to be more to this than just Megara. This Megara sort of nonchalantly deciding, oh, I think I'll possess this Sin character. Uh, in any event, I absolutely love the art. I was invested in the story. Still am. I'm enjoying the hell out of this. I still love, I love Big Barda. I love Zealot. I love how Zealot's kicking Amazon's ass and she constantly is apologizing for killing them. But fortunately, she did a little, she did a little, uh, uh, she did some sort of mystical um, ritual at, before, before she had, before she fully engaged the Amazons on Themyscira so that while she technically kills them and incapacitates them, they don't actually die. They become immediately resurrected. And so how she does that, we don't know. That's It's all related to a past story that'll be told sometime in the future, hopefully by Kelly Thompson, about what what is Zealot's relationship with the Amazons from her past exactly? What is it? It's been hinted at before. It's hinted at more by Kelly Thompson. So I really like the lore here that Kelly Thompson is doing. I like the fact that Kelly Thompson isn't spoon feeding us. I don't mind the fact that I got these questions that I don't necessarily know the answers to. She's probably going to give me the answers and I'm just being overly harsh. The fact of the matter is I'm really enjoying Kelly Thompson's writing here. I'm enjoying this series. I'm also, I subscribe to her newsletter uh, because I'm biased enough that I like her writing. I'm really enjoying The Call. I believe issue five comes out this month. Or if it, uh, I got to check the newsletter because I'm behind on my emails and, and my Substack stuff. So, but in any event, I thought this was a re or a, uh, pretty well done, and it's probably it's probably not quite my pick of the week, but it's it was good enough that it's probably in my top three. So, uh, yeah, there's that. Now, continue. I I, I got to give a shout out to some of the variant covers here. There's a great cover that's behind me with Harley Quinn and Cassandra Kane on the cover. I think that's the cover B. There's a cover C, with black and white with Big Barda looking awesome as hell. 
uh, on a on a cool look and almost like she's on a bat a bat cycle of some kind of motorcycle. My only criticism, I wish it would show her ass a little bit more on the seat of that cycle, but it's still pretty damn cool. Those long, big legs, big part. I mean, hey man, <laughs> she's kick ass. Looks amazing. It's both in color and it's in black and white. It's really cool. I didn't show all the covers here, but it's pretty cool. And there's also a, a another cover by uh zardy i think the cover artist is where uh, a tattooed harley quinn is giving a tattoo to dinah lance the black canary it's quite cool as well but in any event all right continuing on uh the next comic we're going to be reviewing is blue beetle number five all right blue beetle number five this uh, this is sort of the the penultimate issue uh of this arc which is basically the the battle for palmora city it's the it's this battle this epic battle that's been building between blue beetle and the blood scarab and the central mystery from the beginning is who is this blood scarab scarab we learn more of this issue we've learned more in the issues leading up to this and there's uh quite a bit here writer josh trujillo has done a really good job here uh creating a huge cast of characters now i i it could, in terms of the, the pacing, the pacing's been very fast paced. It's been a little bit choppy in, in, from issue to issue because a lot of the scenes, I, I think that the, the pacing has been very fast paced, maybe a little choppy. And there's so many characters to sort of get a handle on here. Now that's probably more uh, something that, it's challenging to me as the reader, but it's a challenge that I'm up for because just to give you an example of all the characters that appear in this issue and that have appeared from the beginning, we got Starfire, we got Victoria Cord, we got Natita, who's the Yellow Beetle, Dynasties, the Green Beetle, we got Jamie, of course, uh, who is the Blue Beetle, we got the the reformed villains gimmicks and Fade Away, uh, we got Uli, who is a member of the Horizon, we got Brenda, who's a friend of the Blue Beetle, uh, we got uh, Kefri, who is the former Pharaoh, who basically. Uh, was the original Blood Scarab and was defeated by the original uh, Blue Beetle, uh, who was defeated by the original Blue Beetle, uh, whose name is was Dan Garrett, and Ke and then Carefree basically uh, possessed the body of uh, Javier 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 ba Basualdo, and so the the human the the. The, the, the person who was bl the blood scarab is actually Javier Basualdo, who is essentially being possessed by the consciousness of Kef Kefri, who is the, the, the pharaoh of, of ancient Egypt that was an, an initially defeated by Dan Garrett uh, back on the, in, the original, in the original series or the, the original iteration of Blue Beetle. Now, there is... Um, uh, a lot of this, uh, it's a lot to dig digest. Uh, and now having said that, one thing that I, while it's a lot to digest, if, if you're a Blue Beetle fan and you're taking the time to read this and like me, you've, you've had to read it twice and God forbid two or three times to get a handle on it, I, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If, you, if you're a fan of the Blue Beetle, I think that you're going to be a fan of this series. I like the use of Starfire here. She's not just a Titan. She's also a mentor to Blue Beetle. I like, I would rather have Starfire here as sort of a mentor slash teacher to Blue Beetle or an inspirational Blue Beetle as opposed to being a teacher at a Teen Titans Academy or some such nonsense, <laughs> right? So I, I, I like what was done here. I also like the use of Victoria, uh, Victoria Cord who uh, w was very upset at the, uh, and, and showed some emotion at the potential almost loss of her brother, Ted Cord, the, the second Blue Beetle. And she finds a way to temporarily uh, create the equivalent of almost uh, some sort of like a, a weaponized energy bomb that temporarily takes away the powers or, or, or weakens the powers of, of all the Beatles here. I'm oversimplifying it, but it's, it's comic book science. But basically, Victoria Cord does, an, does a she does a workaround through some of the technology that Cyborg used in an earlier issue of Blue Beetle, and in the meantime, all the other Blue Beetles are uh, all the other Blue Beetles, all the other Beetles, uh, Natita, Dynasties, Jamie, they're figuring out a way to sort of how are they going to defeat the Blood Scarab, and the, the the ultimate battle takes place at Rogers Coliseum, 
And what they have to do is they have to explode. They have to use the weapon that Victoria Cord creates to simply weaken the blood scarab so that uh, Jamie, of course, then can uh, potentially use lethal force to kill him. I mean, that's been sort of what Jamie has been wrestling with. Does he have to use lethal force? And, uh, you know, he, he doesn't really want to. He's second guessing himself. He's, some, he's got some concerns about using lethal force. And Starfire trusts him to make that decision one way or the other, which is interesting. Uh, it it's, 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 seems to be quite clear that his former girlfriend, uh, girl 13 or whatever her name was there, she, 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 was, she would much prefer that Jamie just used lethal force against the Blood Scarab. But uh, one of the interesting things that happens in this issue is the the evil consciousness of the Blood Scarab, this uh, Kefri, this former pharaoh Kefri, is seems to be speaking and, and o almost overriding and controlling the consciousness of Javier Basualdo. So it might very well be that um, Javier is in fact, or Javier, I always pronounce the J, I apologize to my Spanish listening friends. Uh, Javier is, is likely being controlled and is maybe potentially just as much a victim of the uh, Kefri Pharaoh as, uh, as the victims of the Blood Scarabar. And in any event, this is leading to the penultimate issue where Jamie will have his final battle. The Blue Beetle will have his final battle with Blood Scarab and we'll see what happens here. But I thought this was a... I thought this was, it was a little choppy issue. So much happened in this issue. Some of the transitions, scene transitions were a little bit choppy. The art was, it's okay. Uh, you know, artist, uh, I um, I said the name of the artist here. Uh, forgive me, uh, Gutierrez and, and the Quintana on the colors. Uh, again, it's not bad. It's not, it's not particularly my choice, but Will Quintana on the colors. Adrian Gutierrez, uh, artist. It was, it's still... It's still pretty good. Like it's still pretty good, and the colors really pop off the page. And I actually appreciated when they did a flashback to the original Dan Garrett that they used an older style comic book, a traditional, uh, almost like a Silver Age type of feel comic book style art. So kudos to to the artist there, Gutierrez. So overall, not bad. And yeah, I'm looking forward to to see how Blue Beetle wraps up um, wraps up next issue uh, to complete the uh, story arc. Now, next issue we're uh, review is Fire and Ice issue five. Now, I I got to tell you that I was um, I've got mixed feelings about this issue. I've got mixed feelings about this series in, in particular. I did actually state earlier, yeah, in my in my top ten most disappointing titles for twenty twenty three. I actually did put Fire and Ice on it, sort of, kind of reluctantly because. Well, I was I was disappointed because I really wanted the human target versions of Fire and Ice and not this sort of watered down, very traditional, sort of like tropey, Gilmore Girls sort of approach. Uh, you know, but I will say that uh, Joanne Starrer, Starrer, she does have some moments where there's there's some humor here and there's some good moments between uh, the, the many characters. I do think that there's too many characters, but I do think that this this series does have some appeal, uh, but it's, it's not made for me, but I want to, I want to at least try to be fair and, and, and give it, give it its due. And, uh, this issue, I, I think, I, I think it's sort of, you know, it, it went further away from where I was hoping it was going, but anyways, let's, let, let's talk about it. All right. So first I have to say that there's a lot, there's a lot of dialogue in the issue that I think ultimately, I think it's too wordy. Uh, but then, I guess I I'm, I'm going to show my 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 gender here when I say that you know how it is when women get together. Let's face it, they talk too much. They do. They just do. Uh, you know, if there's a if there's a short way of saying something, they will make sure they find a way to make a, make a long story longer. And, um, and they just, you know, they're, they're talkative and, and they, and they, and they yap and they yap and they yap. And, and, uh, that's how I feel this is, you know, fire and ice are having the same argument that they had in issue one, 
you know, fires feels directionless. She's clearly a, an alcoholic. She makes poor bedroom choices. Uh, she's not, she's not, as she says on this issue, she's, she's not about sleeping with Mr. Right. She's sleeping about Miss, she's about sleeping with Mr. Right now. And last issue, that was Lobo. And there's other issues, there's other characters in, in this issue that uh, slept with, you know, had, had sex last issue. And, uh, Ultimately, the, the the villain that's been slowly creeping up here, and is has been this the, a former I guess a, a villain that's related to the origin of of Ice, and this it's this Crave character that uh, was this sort of um, I guess hunger or cannibalistic eating monster creature that 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 killed her mother back in the day. It doesn't work for me because. When this, when you have a, a story like this that is so silly, and it's it doesn't, it really never at any point takes itself seriously. It's really really hard to even. I I I don't even believe that people died in this issue, even if you showed dismembered parts. I just I I don't believe it. I I don't believe that any anything really bad happens to any of these characters because the whole thing just sort of appears like it's 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 kind of everything's kind of a joke, right? Seriously, isn't it all a joke? Uh, and you've got, you've, you've got gentleman ghost here who, and, and these other characters, this one guy with a brain for an ass and, and they're, they're engaging in like sort of robbing the populace of Smallville and fire and ice, uh, both of them, you know, uh, again, this is reaching the kind of parody and, and, and silliness that, that Harley, the Harley Quinn comic is. And because I find myself finding the plot ridiculous. I find the characters stupid. But then is that a fair criticism to make when I guess that's the point of the story? The, I guess the characters are intended to be stupid. Well, okay. Is, are you, was that the intention of, it was to write a story where all the characters in Smallville are made to look like morons? Was that, was that the intention of the story? Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe and occasionally you got a few laughs from me. I'll, I'll grant you that. But is that really what, is that really what the point was? It just seems, it just seems, um, frankly, a little bit, uh, a little bit pointless to me how all these char characters, I mean, really in this, you know, penultimate issue, uh, you know, we got Ambush Bug, Gentleman Ghost, and all these other characters whose names I forget, and they're, I'm not even sure. They wake up after the, a night of partying. Uh, Lobo was already taken off and, and robbed from them. So Lobo's gone. So, which seems really odd. Why is Lobo gone? And then, and then the friend of Ice, this rock, is possessed by, is possessed by this, uh, this, the island, the, the, the Kui Kui Island. And, uh, apparently, Joanne Star Starer is is references references Justice League America number issue thirty four, where there's an island called Kui Kui that has uh, I don't remember that issue, and I th I think I think the edit I think even the editor screwed up. It's not Justice League America thirty four. It's Justice League International <laughs> issue thirty four. I, I don't think it's Justice League America. I think it's Justice League International number thirty four. But maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, I hope I'm wrong on that. Otherwise, it makes the editor look stupid. And DC editors don't need more fodder to make themselves look stupid. They've had enough. Um, so, anyways, um, I'm. We're, we're headed to a final issue here. We're fire and ice. There, there really is no resolution here. Uh, we just get confirmation that they're they're you know they're both royally screwed up. Clearly, fire. Fire is still an alcoholic. Fire is still not. Fire is just now depressed. Fire doesn't change her ways. Uh, we're we're supposed to feel sorry for her. She's so depressed. She takes responsibility for the fire and the, for the destruction of the house. That isn't even her fault. So I guess we're supposed to feel sorry for her now because not only is she a moron, but then when she finally decides to maybe change her ways, she still lets herself be. She lets herself be treated like the moron that she actually is. So she deserves to be treated like shit because if you if you conduct yourself like a moron, you deserve to be treated like a moron. The fact that you occasionally show some signs of intelligence. That doesn't necessarily mean you deserved any more respect. That just means you maybe just get one less bitch slap. And a bitch you are. And so, but then 
I guess I'm being too harsh. Am I being too harsh on this? Probably. Um, that's just the way this character is. But it ends with Crave, you know, I mean, Martha Kent being threatened by Crave because Crave was looking for, for ice. And because Fire uh, and Fire posted on social media where they were at, Crave knows where to go to get uh, ice. So, again, I, uh, how, how terrible of me to criticize this, this issue, right? It was wrong of me to criticize this issue. Uh, but I'm just going to stop talking about it. It's, it's really not for me. I, my, my personal, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is if, if you're going to, you have an issue like this that treat fire and ice like complete parody. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it, wouldn't of it had been cool if they were treated like femme fatales and shown some respect like they were in Human Target? where they weren't afraid to use lethal force against assholes like Lex Luthor and have some sexiness and some fun and have genuine cover, cover artists that, that treat the characters with a, a degree of dignity and respect and gravitas and agency that shows that they can be really cool characters, not just, I mean, they literally, they're like, they're like Kim Kardashian. They're like basically, you know, Kim Kardashian and, and, and I don't know, some other floozy on, on YouTube that, I mean, it's, this is some vain attempt to get people to relate to them. Come on, you know, it just, it, it's just, it's such a, such a missed opportunity, such a missed opportunity. I would rather, but anyways, I, I vent enough about that. But in any event, this was a misfire for me. And uh, I'm just going to go back to my original criticism that this was, this is a series that shouldn't have been approved, shouldn't, it shouldn't exist. Uh, because it's not actually, I don't feel like, this is not an iteration of the Justice League International, because Fire and Ice are still more kick-ass than this. Uh, they're not, this portrays them like jokes. Just plain jokes. And all the, and if, and, if, and if you want them treated with respect, why do you make all the supporting characters that they interact with complete jokes and parodies of, of just absolute, ridiculously, insanely stupid characters? You know, and again, is, is, I, I get that's the point of this story, but it sh again, this was a miss. This, this was a huge miss. This should not have been approved. Straight up. I don't think it's doing DC any favors. Uh, bring back hum the human target iterations. Have a black label fire and ice series. Do it right. Do it right. Okay, rant over. All right, so let's uh, talk about the next issue now. Um, Neil before Zod. Neil before Zod. Now, this is an interesting opening issue for a villain that we all know and love. And a villain he is becoming again. This guy is no longer uh, an anti-hero or he's, he's clearly on his path from anti-hero to villain. And there's a, lot to, there's a lot to speculate about in this opening issue in terms of where writer Joe Casey is going to be taking this character. I think it's quite clear he's going to be taking him to the dark side. The journey to the dark side is going to be, I think, promises to be quite interesting. Well, the first thing that has to be said is that this issue opens up with uh, Zod. Uh, Zod having a, an, an hallucination of sorts. He... Uh, yeah, he he basically he finds himself he finds himself talking to Jorel, and uh, he he finds himself talking to Jorel, and he, he's clearly hallucinating it. He's hallucinating it in such a way that even one of his uh, you know uh, Kelix like Kryptonian uh, or the Eradicator embodiment of Krypton, the Eradicator being the computer simulation that he speaks to on New Kandor, uh, that, you know, is, is basically saying, are you okay, sir? Because, I mean, you're talking, who the hell are you talking to? So Zod is imagining a conversation with zor -El. And very clearly throughout this entire issue, Zod is actually having a moment where it's something is happening psychologically to zor -El. He is slowly losing it. He's kind of going... You can tell that the evil's taken over. He just can't help himself. He wants to be an asshole. You just know that. And, you know, Zod, you know, one of the things that becomes quite clear here is Zod really is like, he's a conqueror. He's meant to be, he's meant to conquer. 
Uh, he's meant to be a conqueror. And, and I can't help but to think of, uh, compare him to Adolf Hitler. Because Zod, Zod is so great at giving grandiose speeches. He's xenophobic. He thinks that Kryptonians are superior. Uh, in fact, at the beginning of this issue, uh, after, after he's done having his conversation with, uh, with this imaginary conversation with jor Ursa, who's pregnant with their second son, their first son is Lore, but she's pregnant with their second son. She basically, she mentions that they have, they actually have a eugenics program where they're basically using forced evolution to force the native species of New Candor to evolve into something approaching, not as good as Kryptonians, but something like that. And they also have, they also have the, the bottle city of Candor. Remember that, remember the Bendis run where uh, Rogel Czar destroyed and almost destroyed uh, and, and actually killed and, and exterminated Terminated all the inhabitants of the bottle city of Candor. Yes, that actually happened. And then remember what happened where uh, uh, where Raza Gaul tried to resurrect. Uh, they, uh, it was the Zaris pet tried to resurrect the dead citizens of Candor, and they were resurrected. But when they were resurrected, they were they were preserved in a new bottle city of Candor, and Zod took the bottle and took it with him to New Candor with the idea that he's going to help. The, preserve them and help them and it someday come up with the technology to release them uh, onto a new candor and that's exactly what uh, uh, Zod's plan is now now Zod is new candor is part of the United Planets and what's happening here is you know Zod Zod doesn't like appeasement and just just like Hitler I mean you know just like uh, you know how appeasement didn't didn't work for Hitler. Remember, you know, Chamberlain, you know, peace in our time. You know, he was so, in 1938, Munich, you know, he managed to appease Hitler. Well, we know appeasement didn't work on Hitler. Meanwhile, the United Planets is, is trying to appease General Zod here. And it just doesn't work. General Zod is building a weapon on a secret location located somewhere on the planet of New Candor. And he's creating a massive new weapon, a planetary weapon, which... Uh, he, he's got a master plan for, and his son, Lor, uh, Lorzod, he sees what this weapon is, and he's very upset with his, his, his dad, saying, saying, Father, how can you not, you're, you're weak, you're a coward, why don't we use this weapon, we should dominate and control, and, but Zod is speaking in the language of, well, he's sort of suggesting that we're using this, that this is, def it's, it's a defense weapon, he, that Zod believes to rule the galaxy on the principles of distrust and deterrence, and fear, essentially, and that he disagrees with the United Planets that you that that he said a, a universe can only a galaxy can only truly be strong and successful if it's based not on unity, but rather on deterrence and mutually assured destruction. So Zod naturally wants to create a, a, a horrifying weapon. Well, Lore wants to use the weapon, and maybe maybe Zod does too. It's 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 a rather interesting argument. You know, father and son are having an almost an absurd argument. I mean, Lore. I don't know how old Lore is here. Like again, visually with artists, you never know what the artists are told. But Lore looks like he's like maybe ten or twelve years old, and he's throwing a tantrum and he's using his heat vision to attack his father, and then. And then Zod banishes his son Lore because that's through the tradition apparently on Krypton. All the Zods, every generation of Zod was banished because they had to go and find their own. And it's tough love, Zod style, you know. I, you know, Lore, you know, I, I, I'll never tell you I love you because you know I'm, I'm one of those types of fathers. I'll never tell you I love you, but I'll banish you. And it's tough love. I'm just not ever going to tell you I love you. I'm always going to be an asshole to you. But you'll thank me because one day you'll be tough like me and die alone conqueror and, and, and inevitably like me. Anyways, I'm being somewhat facetious, but that's kind of the, 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 the joke here. But, you know, uh, Zod, when speaking to his son, he's having this argument with Lore, and it, when he looks at his son Lore, he sees images, he sort of hallucinates that Lore is, looks a lot, it reminds him of Superman. So it reminds him of some of his arguments with Kalal, and that only further aggravates him and pisses him off. And you, you know, clearly Zod is going through something. Zod is clearly pissed off. He's going through something. And um, he, uh, but regardless, he still banishes lore. This greatly upsets Ursa, uh, Ursa Zod's wife, who, who again is pregnant with their second son. 
And uh, but she nonetheless puts up with it. But she she's upset that that Zod never even bothered to tell Lore why he was being banished. Really, Zord, or Zod just gave his son the impression that he's punishing him for fighting against them and disagreeing with them on the the, the potential use of, of lethal force and 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 exactly how to dominate the galaxy. Um, I mean, basically, it was. For all, Lore, Lore probably is thinking that his, he's, you know, his dad kicked them out because they have, they dif they disagree on politics and governance. It's, it's sort of kind of crazy. <laughs> in any event, uh, Lore takes off, and we know that Lore is going to show up in the series Sinister Sons, where he's going to meet up with Korg, the alleged son of Sinestro. So we'll see where that goes. So, but in any event, this issue ends with, uh, with the Cuns invading or invading but attacking uh, uh, some of the outposts located on new candor where and they're attacking these new species that Z Z that zod and ursa have been sort of uh evolutionarily d d evolving and zod goes nuts and he basically he basically wipes out he wipes out the cuns he he basically exterminates them kills all the cuns that are invading a uh, new candor covers it up the united planets investigates but he, he shuts down the investigation say it's none of my business i got it handled stay away from new candor i don't need your help thank you very much and secretly uh we know that zod is torturing one of the cuns he's kept one of them alive to torture them for information and uh yeah and that's what he does he's got it he he kicks some serious ass here and um yeah and a lot of bloodshed this is a very violent zod zod is getting more and more angry and i got to give a shout out to there's a lot of awesome beautifully illustrated covers there's variant covers for general zod they're all pretty cool here i should give a shout out to uh Shout out to some of them. The cover, there's a gold, there's a gold foil variant, Neil before Zod. It has Zod, Lore, and his wife Ursa uh, uh, alongside him. It's an absolutely gorgeous cover. That's the one I have on order. Cover A is pretty good too, with Zod sort of like holding a holding the planet, uh, holding the planet of uh, well, it actually looks like Earth, but it could also possibly be New Candor. And uh, yeah, there's the cover C and D and there's there's ratio variants as well. I should say that what what Zod is doing that the weapon that he is he is developing uh, on New Candor is actually linked to New Candor's core. It's actually powered by the core of New Candor. Now, whenever like you think Zod would not be so stupid. I mean, how did Krypton explode? Something was wrong with Krypton's core. So what does Zod think? He's going to build a weapon and he's going to use the core, the energies from the core of New Candor to power a weapon. I mean, I can't be the only one that's thinking that this is not going to end well. Something tells me there's going to be another destroyed planet in Zod's future. Only this one is truly going to be 100% Zod's fault. I mean, under a certain interpretation of some of some different iterations of Superman origins have Zod being indirectly responsible for the destruction of Krypton. Uh, so uh, depending on how you view that, this is, uh, this is not going to end well. And, but, uh, so, but, but I like what Joe Casey's doing because it just shows maybe the insanity of General Zod and how inevitably he's going to be on a war path and he's going to come into conflict with the United Planets. And there's likely going to be a galactic war here and it's likely going to be from Zod's own doing and his own machinations. So I, I'm so curious to see where this goes, where Joe Casey is going to be going with this. I'm actually, uh, I'm quite impressed. Uh, his son has been cast out. Uh, his son Lore thinks that his father has la lacks vision and uh, his Zod uh, accuses his son of being insolent and uh, being filled with the arrogance of youth and possessing a sense of unearned entitlement. Uh, certainly cat phrases that we learn uh, and we hear about regularly on various forms of social media today. So that's Joe Casey sort of reflecting aspects of her own culture in the argument between Zod and his son Lore. But in any event, uh, overall I thought this was... Uh, a very interesting and action-packed and and just fun opening issue, and I'm definitely invested with this. I'm again. I, this is probably in in competition 
for probably the top three of the week. So my pick of the week, it's getting more difficult as I'm going through this year and as I talk about it and reflect on this. So that is Neil before, that's Neil before Zod and the opening issue. The next issue that we're going to re review is, next comic is Poison Ivy issue 18. Now, the cover of this issue, issue 18, has the words morning sickness on it. Morning being mourn, as in mourn, you're sad. Morning sickness. Poison Ivy, it would appear, is pregnant. And this issue sort of builds upon sort of a common, a common sort of theme and narrative that that has existed from the beginning of this. And this is, once again, it's Jason Woodrow, the Floronic Man, plays a role in this. Floronic Man seems to be a villain that neither J. Wallet Wilson or, or Poison Ivy seem to be able to avoid. I I can't help but feel that that we we've already been told this story already because we already saw Jason Woodrow. We've been dealing with these Lamia spores for quite a while now, and it's the Lamia spores seem to be the gift that keep on giving and the gift that no one's really asking for. And who? why would you? They are Lamia spores after all. Uh, DC has quite a lot of spores lately with Beast, between Beast World and Poison Ivy. Spores are everywhere in the DC universe. But um, Pamela Isley in this issue, she... She is. Uh, she needs some help. She feels a little bit overwhelmed, and she basically finally has some degree, some sense of self awareness in this issue. And after uh, after realizing that uh, that you know because of her interactions with with Killer Croc and and Solomon Grande, she realizes that you know maybe with these Lamia spores and maybe with all these undead plant people coming back to life and showing up and causing all this havoc, and since I can't control it, and they seem to be attracted toward me, and I can't stop them, and, you know, uh, maybe I should ask for Batman's help, and that's what she does. And Batman shows up, Batman's frustrated, I mean, we all know Batman's got other things, you know, on the go himself right now, uh, and, but Pamela says, look, I need your help. Pamela doesn't like Batman. Poison Ivy does not like Batman. Batman does not like Poison Ivy. Despite the fact that Poison Ivy is clearly a homicidal, she is psychotic. Uh, you know, Batman's not a psychologist. Uh, but of course, he always makes the judgment call. I mean, let's face it. I, I'm wondering if, it, has anybody let more psychopaths, given more psychopaths a free pass than Batman? Who's given psychopaths more who's given more psychopaths a free pass than batman i don't think anybody has uh, i mean he he gives arkham asylum a run for its money uh and once again he gives P pamela isley a free pass here pa pamela meets with batman she tells him yeah i pretty much caused all this these are lamia spores and th th but this is the antidote and don't you arrest me i'm just you know i know i caused all this mess but i'm giving you the antidote now um that's that the logic there is absurd. It's sort of like saying, well, you know, I created a, wor a potentially world-destroying uh, set of Lamia spores that will make the entire world undead plant creatures. Uh, but, but since I told you I did that, and since I might have the antidote to, what I, to a problem I caused in the first place, don't you arrest me, Batman, or don't you take me in. Don't make me face justice for me being the psychopathic, uh, lesbian, uh, crazy psycho bitch that I am. Don't you love the logic of comic books? High degree of verisimilitude in this issue. Uh, and of course, as always, Janet from HR is there uh, at the end uh, after Batman leaves. Pamela goes into labor pain. She suddenly, she suddenly looks, she suddenly gets pregnant and this, this gr developing life form in her basically rips open her belly and out pops out the Floronic Man, the Floronic Man, Jason Woodrow, is born. He now is in a position where apparently he can devour the world. Uh, this is, frankly, I have to say, this is a really, truly disgusting issue from, in terms of when, you, when I describe what happens. Visually, it's, it's interesting because the, the art isn't near as, um, it's interesting that the art is almost PG-13. Uh, I almost, I wish the art was more graphic. 
I mean, the pharaonic man rips open the stomach, pops out of the stomach of Pamela Isley. That should be a gory and horrific scene. And instead, we see more of the face from Janice from HR. Janice being the uh, uh, far too promiscuous young girl whose who's claim to fame is having slept with both Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn and doesn't seem to have the heart to tell him, despite the fact that neither Harley or Poison Ivy care. Uh, but in any event, yeah, Pamela Isley, Poison Ivy is now given birth to Floronic Man. Kind of sick and disgusting on multiple levels. I'm not really sure how Harley's going to, he, you know, what's, what's Harley going to think of that? It's like, my God, I slept with you. Janet of HR is thinking, I slept with you. And you gave birth to the pharaonic man. What the hell's going on? This is kind of, you know, it, it's kind of disturbing on multiple levels. But it is what it is. And that's really it. Now, uh, how is Pamela Isley going to recover? How is she going to defeat the Floronic Man now? She's, is she dead? I mean, she should be dead, but then Poison Ivy is Poison Ivy. And so she's probably not because she's given birth and birth to this thing. Uh, is it like a daddy long leg thing? You give birth to it, then you die? I don't know. But regardless, um, I thought it, not much happened. Not much happened. I feel that this is a plotting sort of plot line that never, it's the plot line that doesn't want to end. I don't think it's really going anywhere. I mean, we've, I would, uh, I'd like to see more villains. We've only ever really gotten, we've only gotten actually two villains. I feel we've only gotten two worthwhile villains in, in the entire like 18 issues of Poison Ivy. But let me talk about right now, I want to talk about the backup to all the DC titles uh, this week. And that is, uh, it's a preview to Action Comics. It's an Action Comics preview written by Jason Aaron and John Timms. Uh, pardon me, written by Jason Aaron with art by John Timms uh, and colors by Rex Locus. And basically it's a teaser for Batman facing off against Bizarro. Bizarro, uh, Jason Aaron, uh, uh, essentially says in uh, in an interview that's also attached in the back of every comic DC comic this week uh, that he basically, he loves the all-out weirdness of Bizarro. He says, but I also saw the chance to bring a darker, more sorrowful edge to the character. This is a broken, damaged version of poor Bizarro who stumbles upon a revelation about himself that allows him to strike in a wild new way against the world that he has hated and mocked him for far too long. There is going to, it looks like there's a potential supernatural element now to Bizarro. It's almost as if he's got a myriad of arcane ingredients that seem to broaden his mind and his scope in terms of he sees a broader, he's, his mind is broadened to the, the larger universe and multiverse as a whole. And how does this make Bizarro more powerful? What is Bizarro's agenda? We don't know. But I like it. I really like what, uh, I, I really like what, what Jason Aaron has done with Batman Offworld. And, and so I'm quite pleased with that. And so I'm certainly going to be checking out Action Comics uh, by Jason Aaron because he's certainly, uh, so far, his, uh, his run at DC is so far, it's, uh, he's one for one. So maybe he'll be two for two. We'll have to wait and see. But, uh, you know, yeah, check out the, the backup features uh, uh, contained in any comic book this week of January 2nd, uh, 2024. So, all right. So... Uh, the next issue, the next comic we're going to be reviewing is Shazam issue seven. And speaking of uh, Bizarro, uh, we get a we get a Shazam version of Bizarro in Shazam number seven. Uh, kind of interesting. It opens up right away. Uh, writer Mark Wade, uh, art by uh, Sinsuka. Uh, art by, pardon me, uh, Mark Wade, Goran Suzuka is the uh, artist, and Ive, uh, uh, Ive Zvorsina on colors and Troy Pittery on the letters. And it starts off with uh, b the Bizarro Captain fighting, uh, fighting Shazam. And it's, it's actually quite, quite interesting because the one has to wonder, uh, one has to wonder what are the powers of a Bizarro Shazam? And I really like Mark has a very sort of clever, Mark Wade has a clever take on it. It's actually Felix Faust that creates this bizarre version of Shazam. But just like Shazam, uh, Shazam has the wisdom of uh, Solomon and the, and the strength of Hercules, et cetera, et cetera. He figured out that if Bizarro is the opposite of Superman, uh, or if, the, if, if Bizarro is the opposite of Shazam, 
Just like the Bizarro Superman is in many ways backwards or the opposite of Superman, a Bizarro Shazam might be the opposite of Shazam. And so he might also reflect the opposite of the various traits of the gods that make up Shazam. And so unlike having the wisdom of Solomon, a Bizarro Shazam would be an idiot. Uh, unlike having the wisdom of Solomon, he'd be an idiot. Unlike having the strength of Hercules, he could be weak. Unlike having the, the courage of Achilles, he might be very, uh, he might be insecure. And of course, that's exactly what happens. And so it, it was kind of a, a clever little thing. It was a quick opening sequence. And, and Billy Batson slash Shazam figures it, out, figures it out right away. Meanwhile, that was actually the funnest part of the issue. Uh, the, the rest of the issue, quite frankly, I didn't find all that interesting it, because it has to do with the dinosaurs getting pissed off at Black Adam because the the accounting dinosaurs, which I was a really, I thought it was a really dumb storyline. I, um, I didn't put Shazam in my top 25 for DC um, uh, this year in 2023. I just thought it was, it, it was okay, but it just wasn't. I just didn't find it uh, good enough to make them make the mark. It was okay, but I it, it, the silliness factor. While it was, it's kind of fun. I fun. Uh, I just it's a little bit too stupid uh, with with the dinosaurs and the accounting dinosaurs. I don't really get it. And you know, Black Adam gets pissed off at Shazam. Uh, he doesn't realize he doesn't realize like like Shazam does, or part of me like. Cap, the captain does that that these dinosaurs just it's a question of just filling out paperwork taking the time to fill paperwork out and they go away they're just really anal about their paper their galactic paperwork and black adam and the captain battle it out and you know there's you know again great great art there's a huge battle sequence and really all it ends up happening is that the the adoptive home of billy batson is completely destroyed just when uh, at the worst possible time because his adoptive parents bought a new home, but in order to be able to afford to buy their new bigger home, they needed to sell their old one. Unfortunately, the old one gets destroyed because of the battle between the captain and Black Adam. And so it's uh, truly unfortunate. But we get a really cool, I mean, there's, there's a lot of action here between first the Bizarro captain versus the captain and then Black Adam versus the captain. So, it show, so it's action-packed. Although not much happens, but uh, Goran Suzuka, uh, as the artist, does a really does a pretty good job here because there's a there's, there's a, the action is is pretty cool, and quite frankly, if if you if you're somebody that just likes a lot of great action sequences in a comic, if you're gonna just buy one DC comic this week and you just want straight up action, buying the Shazam issue, you get action between the Bizarro Captain and and, and Captain slash Shazam between Black Adam and the Captain, and you also get the Bizarro backup, which is a battle between Bizarro and Superman. So you get a lot of Bizarro love and a lot of action. Uh, so if you're, going to, if you're going to pick one DC comic for the backup of Bizarro, you might want to consider getting the Shazam. Also, it's got a pretty cool cover with Black Adam hoisting the body of Shazam above his head, for those of you who are listening on the comic source. So, yeah, not a heck of a lot happened, but it was, uh, you know, again... Again, it was definitely uh, definitely action packed. So, continuing on, the next comic we will review is Superman, uh, the Metal Curtain. Superman seventy eight, the Metal Curtain. Now, I have to tell you that I, uh, I think Jace maybe is more of a fan of this than I am. Robert Venditti is does a really good job with art by uh, uh, Goodry of uh, and colors by Jordi Belair in in capturing the spirit and the essence of the Christopher Reeves Superman and every aspect of that movie and from, from Lois Lane to Perry White to Lex Luthor is really very much embodied. Uh, and even that, that 19 sort of 70 sense of feel and, and tone and, and ambiance is represented in this particular uh, comic book. I should say that one of the, uh, one of the covers for Superman 78, I think it's cover B is is one that I quite like. It shows a Christopher Reeve Superman, you know, waving to a kid who's sitting in a in a in a flight, sitting in an airplane, staring out the window, and he's reading the first issue, a reprint of the first issue of of uh, Superman number one, as Christopher Reeve is waving to him outside the window. It's really nice. 
and the and the trade dress logo of Superman, the Metal Curtain seventy eight is it's much smaller and then and in the upper right portion of the the cover, it looks really nice and it's probably one that I'm not I'm not collecting this series. I'm not buying the the floppies of this one. Uh, it's just not my cup of tea. I just find it uh, I just find it. Uh, I find it boring and for reasons which I'll go into, but for those who just want uh, their Christopher Reeve fix, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, this is right up your alley. But I am getting the cover by. There's a cover by here. I'm, I'm getting that cover that I just mentioned with the kids sitting in the flight. That's that's pretty cool. Now, um, now just to elaborate on on the story itself. Uh, the metal curtain is really about Metallo. The Soviets uh, find a chunk of uh, kryptonite and they create their own version of Metallo. And last issue it really ended with Metallo humiliating and defeating Superman. And in this issue, Superman uh, Superman meets, uh, wakes up. He is recovering. He's been he's recovered by the U.S. military. His body is recovered by the U.S. military. Uh, and he recovers and he meets Lois Lane's father, General Sam Lane. And... Uh, you know, Sam Lane here seems he's he's less of an asshole than he is in the mainstream DC universe. In the mainstream DC universe, Sam Lane is kind of a hard ass. He's kind of a dick. Um, but this one, he's he's a little bit less of a dick. But he's still a he's still a military man, and he's still a little suspicious of Superman. But he's well aware of Project Metallo, and uh, he he he's aware that it's a new weapons program being developed by the Soviets, supposedly more powerful than their entire nuclear arsenal. And uh, one of the uh, one of the things that Superman tells him is that you know I'm still I'm going to stick with this. I have to fight Metallo. I have to stop him. Sam Lane, the general, just wants General Lane just wants him to stay away. Let us handle it. Um, you know, you got your ass kicked. You got your ass handed to you. And he's not, he's not particularly fond of the fact that Superman, uh, he, he sort of infers or knows that he's got, that there's a relationship or something going on between Superman and his daughter. Uh, Superman flies back to the fortress. Lois Lane, I mean, Superman is clearly having, he's having relations with Lois. He's having a lot of fun with her. I mean, he's got that massive bed in the Fortress of Solitude. Um, you know, he's, uh, uh, again, uh, kudos to Robert Vendetti. He, he's very much capturing the essence of that Superman movie, the Christopher Reeve movie. And straight up, that's why it's this series. I just, I, I want a little bit more. I want, I want it to be spiced up. But I realize if something isn't broke, why fix it? So I completely understand why I'm sure the vast majority of people who enjoy this series would vehemently disagree with me. And I completely respect that. I personally would just like to see a Christopher Reeve that's elevated a little bit more into maybe a more of a modern day sensibility, a modern day interpretation, uh, and and frankly, even artistically as well. And Gary Frank did that when Jeff Johns wrote that. So we've already gotten that. So I, I have gotten my dose of that. But I would have liked to have seen that in this as well. Maybe an older Christopher Reeve who's maybe in his 50s or 60s as, as an older Superman. Maybe someday we'll get that with this, uh, you know, call it Superman 99, you know, 20 years later or, super, or Superman, instead of Superman 78, Superman 98. I, I, think, I, I think inevitably maybe we'll get that. So uh, maybe I'm just, uh, I'm just wishful thinking here, but I'm not wishing, I'm asking. DC, please give us that, okay? I mean, if uh, if uh, if the Magger in the Birds of Prey uh, can confuse a wish from an ask, well, so can I. Uh, but in any event, this issue, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, Clark Kent, I mean, it follows the trope of sort of the, like the, the really bad plot of Superman 3 and even the bad trope of the plots of Superman 4. And... Superman 3 and Superman 4 were probably, I think most people will agree, the worst of the, of the, of the Superman movies, 3 and 4, and just really boring plots. That's what this feels like to me. It, it, nothing really feels that much as... It, 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 it doesn't really feel that much as at stake. And um, although at the end, finally, we get Lex Luthor showing up, which is a pleasant surprise because at least maybe Lex Luthor can make this be a little bit more exciting. But again... I have a feeling I could almost predict what Luther's going to do in the next issue because it's it's a little bit too simplistic. And um, again, it's it's so simplistic that it's one of the reasons why 
I'm not getting the, uh, I'm just not getting the, the physical copies. I actually thought that the original story of, of the Superman 78 was actually, was actually better. Like it actually had some originality to it more so than this. This feels very derivative to me and a little bit tropey and just very, very predictable for some reason. Uh, nothing really seems to have, uh, you know, and again, what I'm giving here is an underhanded compliment because again, if you love Christopher Reeve, there's no reason why you shouldn't get this. I just, for me, I just want that the plot's just too silly. And there's a reason why I almost never watch Superman 3 and Superman 4. And when, when, I mean, when I watch the classic Superman movies, it's always Superman 1 and 2. I never watch Superman 3 and 4. Why? Especially 4. Good God. It's, those are embarrassments to, to, to filmmaking. Uh, but Superman 1 and 2, as, as, as wonky as the special effects are, it just warms my heart to watch those again. But in any event, this has a Superman 3 or Superman 4 feel to it. That's why it's just disappointing to me. Uh, in any event, uh, but hey, it is what it is. It's not for everybody. All right, so uh, the next issue uh, is, and the final issue is, uh, that we're the final comic we're reviewing is Titans Beast World, Titans Beast World Tour Atlantis issue one. I hope that doesn't mean we're getting an issue two, uh, but let's get into it. All right, well, uh, just to review, Beast World is involved, uh, the Titans finally deciding to do something akin to what would justify them being replacements for the Justice League, where they defeated the Necro Star thanks to a master plan by Beast Boy to essentially uh, become a giant star -o called Garo and defeat the Necro Star. And unfortunately, in defeating the Necro Star, the uh, Dr. Hate, who's working at the behest and under the control and manipulation of Amanda Waller, essentially created a situation where Beast Boy's consciousness was essentially seemingly destroyed, although Raven is currently trying to uh, obtain the consciousness or save the, the, the mind of Beast Boy, wherever the hell that might be. And the, the various aspects and con the various pieces of Beast Boy's consciousness are in the form of spores that have been shot all around the planet Earth and are infecting uh, various, many human, millions of human beings. But in particular, are these spores, these Garo spores, are attracted to metahumans, to the superhero community, because it's attracted to the most powerful people that you can imagine, and that, of course, is uh, superheroes. And so... It, it affects the entire world, and in this particular one-shot, which I believe it's a one-shot, I hope it's just a one-shot, for reasons which I'll get into, well, well, uh, well, Atlantis is affected, and part of this world tour that these spores are going on, I mean, we had, world, we, we had they were in Gotham, they were in Metropolis, they were in Central City, and now, of course, Atlantis is also being infected by spores, and what do we have in Atlantis? We've got Aquaman, we've got Tula, we have got Garth, uh, who, uh, remember Garth is part of the problem here because him and Brother Blood, he sides with Brother Blood. He followed, he followed the doctrination of, he, he bought into the doctrination of, of Brother Blood saying that, you know, I mean this, you know, the humanity is, is, is corrupt and we've got to, we've, uh, you know, they, they, they destroy everything they touch. And of course this, this issue takes place before t uh, Titans issue six, where Garth, uh, discovers that uh, Brother Blood is actually uh, not uh, is actually uh, a Tamaranian that uh, used to uh, a Tamaranian that uh, is linked to Starfire's past. And in any event, uh, in terms of uh, what happens in this issue, it consists of three stories. And the first story is called Wild Blue, uh, and uh, seen, written by Cena Grace with, with fantastic art by Ricardo Federici and Lee, Lee Lowridge uh, on the colors and Dave Sharp on the letters. And it's, it's, it, this, is re this is really gorgeous. I mean, it's, it's, it starts off with Batman battling a, a tiger shark. And it's really, really nice. It, it, it's gorgeous. And it basically has Aquaman just reflecting on all of this being a distraction. And Garth having a conversation with Tula. And again, this art is just absolutely epic. It looks really good. Garth and, and Tula end up having to, they end up being attacked by, uh, they end up being attacked by, well, I guess Atlanteans that are possessed by these spores. 
And uh, again, gorgeous art. The Federer, uh, my God, Federer uh, Ricci's art is just truly fantastic. And amongst all this chaos, Aquaman shows up and sort of politely scolds Garth and says, get your ass to the Titans. Like, I can handle this here. I mean, this is my battle, but it's your war. I mean, you, you're part of the Titans now. I mean, you, 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 you're responsible for something bigger. You're the equivalent of the Justice League. Your responsibilities aren't just Atlantis now. If you're a Titan, you got to think like a Justice League member. You're a Titan member. You got to get your ass out there in the whole world. And remember, your whole the whole world is your oyster, not just Atlantis. So you got to man up, you know, uh, and, you know, stop, you know, it's, you know, how lovely that, Garth, that you decided to come back to Atlantis, talk to your girlfriend, uh, but go out and be a man and be a hero. And uh, get your head out of your ass. And then uh, just right after he does that, uh, Aquaman, unfortunately, gets uh, possessed by a spore and uh, turns into this sort of like sea-like creature. Now, that, and that's really how that first story ends. And, um, and it also ends with Mira, with Mira taking uh, their daughter Andy, giving it to Jackson Hyde and saying, you know, take care of her. And there's more, more about Mira and Jackson Hyde in a minute. Because the next is, the next story is written by Frank uh, Thierry, and it's with artist uh, with art by Valentin Delandro and uh, Marisa Louise, the colorist. Now, I I had PTSD. I suffered PTSD when I saw Valentin Delandro's art because it's the same artist that did the uh, uh, one of the probably one of the most horrific comics of 2022, and that was Black Manta. Uh, which Chuck Brown's story, while I could maybe get a sense of what he was going at, was just, it was a narrative mess and the art was horrendous. But I will say this about Valentin Delandro's art. It's a marked improvement from the abortion uh, on a crust that was the Black Manta series. The backgrounds here are much better. The facial expressions are much better. The, the, uh, the, the, even the, 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 the coloring is better. So there's a Marisa Louise. I'm not sure if Marisa Louise colored Black Manta series, uh, colored the Black Manta series, but there's a better, it, it just, there's a better collaboration between the art and the coloring here. And it, it, it's much better. And, and, uh, and it's got a better writer, Frank Thierry, frankly, his, his writing is, is better. This, this story involves, this story involves uh, Deadeye, uh, Deadeye, and Captain Boomerang and Vixen trying to rescue Black Manta, who's possessed by one of the spores, and he naturally turns into a giant manta. And we, we know from, uh, I believe, we know from one of the backups of uh, Beast, Titans Beast World, I think it's Metropolis, one of the other Titans, that, that Deadeye is tr and Vixen are trying to form a new team to go up against Amanda Waller. So Deadeye, Vixen, along with... Uh, uh, Calvin L. Ellis, uh, Superman, uh, is trying to, for they're trying to form a new team to go up against, uh, the, uh, oh, Amanda Waller and they want Black Manta to join the team and they are successful here of, they are successful in removing the spore from the mouth of this giant man manta ray and in doing so the manta ray devolves back into, uh, uh, Black Manta, so he can, uh, he's, he's grateful that he's being rescued and they're hoping that they, they, they're hoping to recruit him to their team. Unfortunately, uh, what happens is that Captain Boomerang betrays the team and because they, Vixen and Deadeye, the only reason they were using Captain Boomerang is because, because Captain Boomerang has some affiliation through the Suicide Squad and, and maybe they were hoping Black Manta even though he's possessed by the spore, he would see a familiar face and it would make it easier to, to calm him down before removing the spore. In any event, that was a mistake that'll come back to haunt them because Captain Boomerang, in the hopes of lowering his sentence, uh, uh, tells Amanda Waller that Deadeye is forming a team. Now, maybe that's misdirection. Maybe Vixen and Deadeye knew that Captain Boomerang would uh, would betray them and, and inform Amanda Waller. So that might just be a, pl a clever play on their part and some misdirection on the part of the writer, Frank Thierry. But whatever it is, I thought that the writing w was good here and I thought that it's further planting some seeds. And I like the fact that we're getting Black Manta on the team. 
and between Deadeye, Vixen, Black, uh, Black Manta, and uh, you know um, uh, the uh, the the Black Superman. There uh, uh, is it. Uh, I, I I might get it wrong. It's not. I don't. It's not Calvin Alice. It's uh, is it Larzod uh, uh, or Val? A Valzod, Valzod from Earth Two. In any event, I apologize. You guys can correct me in my chat. I think it's Valzod for the Earth Two uh, Superman. Uh, in any event, uh, I thought it, I thought this was probably one of the better ones, uh, despite the fact that I'm not a huge fan of the artist. The art was actually more tolerable this time. And uh, now that leads us into the the final uh, story in the issue, written by uh, uh, the final story in the issue, which was. Uh, written by Megan Fitzmartin, Out of His Depths. Now, I was pretty hard on Megan Fitzmartin. She's ha she had a horrible 2023 between, uh, but 2022 was Young Justice, 2023 was the god-awful Tim Drake Robin, uh, and here she is doing a, a spin, you know, a, a collateral issue of Out of His Depths, uh, telling the story of Jackson Tide and Andy and Mira. And, but this actually wasn't bad. Uh, Megan Fitzpatrick, the writer, uh, M.L. Sinapo as the artist, and Michael Antilli, and, and and the, the colorist, Clayton Cowles on the letters. This actually wasn't, again, it wasn't bad. Um, it, it, it's a little bit, I would say, plot-wise, it's a little silly. It, it, Jackson Hyde and Andy, they're being attacked, and Jackson Hyde wants to use his powers He's sort of, I guess he's got some, he's got these strange electrical powers and he's, he's, uh, he's hoping that when he uses the electrical powers on these, there's some Amazons, there's rogue Amazons that have been possessed by sores, like Amazons from Themyscira. How on earth rogue Amazons from Themyscira became possessed by spores and then decided to invade Atlantis? The logic there escapes me, but... I guess you just got to go with it because I guess, what do you do when you're a rogue Amazon? You know, I, I mean, the whole world doesn't like Amazons right now because of Tom King's run. And uh, so the world, the U.S. is against Amazons. And so Amazons are either hated by the United States government or they're otherwise being attacked by spores and being converted into strange sea creatures and invading Atlantis. Good grief. It ain't a good year to be an Amazon. In any event, Jackson Hyde, in, you know, manages to change some of the Amazons back. Mira shows up and nonsensically gets pissed off at Jackson Hyde, accuses him of throwing a tantrum. And she, Mira is, again, honestly, this is just, I think, bad scripting, bad writing on the part of Fitzmartin. But uh, the reality is, is that Mira is a complete bitch. And Jackson Hyde is clearly helping out, clearly doing the right thing. He clearly knows what he was doing. For some reason... Out of the blue, I don't know why Jackson Hyde says he, one of the things that he reveals here is that he doesn't look up to his dad or Aquaman, but he actually, Mira is the one that he aspires the most to be. He's the most inspired by Mira, which I, I, I guess is okay. I guess, does he want to be king? Does he want to be queen? I just thought that was, it was a little odd. It was sort of like out of the blue. And also since... It's an odd comment to make, especially since she's she's clearly not particularly bright. She comes across like a bitch. Her logic, she's her actions are devoid of logic. She only gets in the way. She makes things worse, and then Mary gets possessed by a spore. So she's neither particularly bright, particularly intelligent, and actually does more damage. And since she is a member of a royalty, even though Atlantis is now technically a democracy. Uh, the fact is she just made the situation worse. So, uh, and this is apparently who Jackson Hyde aspires to be. Um, again, with a few tweaks to the script, the stupidity of Mira could have been ameliorated somewhat. But hey, it is what it is. The more interesting aspect of the story, which I will give Fitzmartin props for, is Andy displays some of her powers. Uh, and there's a, even an editorial note referencing back to Future State Aquaman, uh, which just to remind uh, some of you who, uh, while Future, DC's Future State was not a particularly beloved series by any stretch of the imagination, there's no question that one of the better issues of DC's Future State was the Aquaman, uh, the Aquaman two-issue series, 
which dealt with an older Andy with fantastic art by Daniel Samper, which I would encourage you if you guys, if you're on the DC app, uh, comics app, or if you happen to find those back issues of uh, DC Future State of Aquaman in your comic shop and you got them for, and they're in the dollar bin or $3 bin, pick them up. You won't be disappointed. It was fascinating. And it also gave you, uh, put on full display the powers, the fully, uh, the, almost fully developed powers of an of an of an older Andy. This is a young Andy as, as an infant and her powers are on display here and she's able to reach the mind of a possessed Mira who's possessed by and overtaken by the spore. I thought that was was very well done and it, it really displays um, young Andy's powers. And I thought that was I thought that was well done and I thought that was pretty cool. And um, yeah and so and this is going to be continued in Titans Beast World. And uh, there you have it. And then, of course, you have the backup of Bizarro. So overall, uh, out, of the, out, of the three, out of the three stories, none of them are really absolutely necessary. I think the one that maybe is the most... I, I actually like the Fitz Martin story for, for, for the art. The art I really liked. And I really liked... I liked seeing Andy display her powers. I even liked the story written by uh, Frank Thierry. And tolerable art by Valentin Delandro, where it shows uh, the the lengths to which uh, the lengths to which uh, Vixen and Deadeye are going to try to uh, create a, a a competent team to face off against Amanda Waller, and we're going to see how that will play out in in uh, presumably out past even the conclusion of Beast World, and so I th overall I thought this was uh, this was actually I think. The, the best tie-in so far of into Beast World. None of them are necessary. Don't get me wrong. None of these are necessary tie-ins by any stretch. But I think this is the one, the Aquaman, the Atlantis one, Beast World Tour uh, Atlantis, I found actually the most uh, intriguing or the most, that, that actually added the most, uh, you know, I guess somewhat kind of cool information and some cool moments of some characters that otherwise uh, I haven't seen in a while. And so that that wraps it up, guys. Um, I, I should say that uh, I have to, if I have to decide now what for, for the week of January 2nd, 2024, what is my pick of the week? Uh, man, I gotta tell. I'm gonna give you my top three here. My for the pick of the week, I'm gonna say that uh, it's a toss up between. It's gonna be a toss up between Neil before Zod, number one, uh, Joe Casey. I think I really like where he's taken uh, General Zod, uh, and between Batman 141 because I, I I like Zernov possessing a failsafe or being part of the failsafe's programming, and I. I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind birds of prey. I don't mind birds of prey, uh, but I have to pick one. I'm gonna go with Neil before Zod, and uh, uh, because why am I going with Neil before Zod? Because you know what? I there's this thing that's happened. I'm I'm kind of getting a little bit sick and tired. There's always pet peeves, you know. It, it you know I, a week might go by and maybe my mood changes, right? But I, I'm getting a little bit sick and tired of anti-heroism. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm really sick and tired of seeing... Maybe it's the Poison Ivy Harley Quinn effect. I'm so sick and tired. When, like, Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn, they're villains. And they, they should act like villains and they should be treated like villains. And, and, and they should be respected, uh, but treated like garbage if they're villains and their behavior is deserved of such. I don't like... You know, look, if you're a villain, let them be villains. Let them be assholes. Everybody is so these corporate gurus are so deathly afraid of letting their characters be jerks, be villainous, be evil. Let your villains be villains. And it's so great. It's so refreshing to read. I encourage people to check out, uh, there's a number of interviews that Joe Casey, uh, comic book writer Joe Casey has given. He's the writer on Neil Before Zod, where he talks about, he was taken aback. He basically says he, he, he couldn't believe that Zod had sort of been like, <laughs> made nicer those are my words, not his. You know, this Neil before Zod, bring back the evil in Zod. It's okay for Zod to be an asshole. Let him embrace being evil. Uh, because that's that's what we want. I mean, everybody loves a good redemption arc. Well, you know what? Sometimes I don't. 
I don't want Zod to be redeemed. I don't want Poison Ivy to be redeemed. I don't want Harley Quinn to continue on the path of redemption. I don't want Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn to have a happily ever after. Ever. Ever. Ever after. Ever. No, never. Why? Because they don't deserve it because they're villains and they're psychopathic. And they're crazy. Call them mentally ill because you want. You want sympathy for mentally ill people? You can have all that in this world. In, in, in this world. Okay, and I have compassion for mental ill in this world too. Not in comic books. No, comic books, let them be assholes, let them be villains. I digress there. I'm, I'm re apparently, I have a thing for uh, Harley and Poison Ivy. Uh, but so does Janet from HR. In any event, let Zod be a villain. Thank you, Joe Casey, for reminding readers that Zod is a villain. And I like the fact that his son is also an asshole. My biggest fear is that, you know, we're going to get Sinister Sons and we're going to get Korg and Lor Lorzod and they're going to be like, they're going to be like little anti-heroes and end up doing the right thing in the end. I hope not. No. Write the villain, write the sons of Sinestro and Zod like the assholes and villainous pricks they deserve to be written like. Sometimes no redeeming qualities makes for better entertainment and it ought to because that's what you're supposed to do when you write villains. We have a whole shit pile of legacy characters in the DC universe. 99% of them are all heroic legacies. Build up the villainous legacies. Villains have children too. And please, please, please understand that it's okay to let their children become the villainous bastards that their parents are. Because parents deserve to have, evil parents deserve to have evil children and we readers deserve to have a next legacy of villains as well. And hopefully, and Joe Casey understands that. Hopefully DC will continue to understand that and expand the villain, villainous roster and legacy of villains in the DC universe moving forward. And uh, with that long-winded comment, I should probably try to find, am I going to find my image that says pick of the week? I think I found it here. There we go. My pick of the week for Neil before Zod. All right. And uh, with that, people, I am going to sign off. Uh, if you have any, uh, if you, if you're listening to the, if you want to listen to this as a podcast, please uh, go to Chase's, uh, the Comic Source podcast. You can go to any place that, that you can find podcasts. You'll find it's a, the Comic Source podcast. Uh, Chase does a lot of interviews. And he does a lot of, uh, he, obviously, the weekly DC podca uh, uh, podcast uh, that we review every week, every DC comic. Uh, he also, he's, he's brought back his uh, Spawn Daily. Uh, he's going to be doing that again and continue past. He did the first, I did the first 12 issues with him and he's going to be doing the, he's got the first 24 in the bag. So uh, I may or may not join him on that. He's invited me to do that. We shall see. Um, and uh, he's also just did the, the 12 Days of Christmas. Uh, he's got a big idea interview coming up and talking about the Bad Idea comics. We did the 12 Days of Christmas of Bad Idea. Uh, he posted them on his channel. So check out the Comic Source YouTube channel, the Comic Source podcast. And also uh, you can check out, uh, obviously, my channel. I just did my top 25 DC for 2023. I did my top 10 most disappointing DC. And I will also be putting out albeit late, my top 10 indies for 2023. There were so many fantastic indies. I only touched the surface, but I mean, there's so many to choose from. I love the hell out of 2023, notwithstanding some of the people who, uh, 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 for their own reasons, uh, maybe weren't quite as uh, happy with 2023 as I was overall. So in any event, guys, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, until next time, comic boom. And on behalf of Jace, who hopefully will get better for next week, <laughs> Comic Boom and Comic Source out. <laughs>